It is 100 years since what was called Spanish flu killed more than 50 million people. If the next big pandemic comes, how ready are we? Flu viruses may well be constantly changing, but it is thought now we may one day be able to beat them once and for all. Welcome to Roundtable, I'm David Foster. The Spanish flu killed people at a speed never seen before. Today, scientists and historians are still puzzling over its severity and the death pattern that affected about 4% of the world's population. It was the deadliest pandemic of the 20th century. Over 50 million people killed between 1918 and 1920. But a hundred years on since the first outbreak of Spanish flu, how at risk are we of another global outbreak? Spanish flu broke out in the final stages of World War I. It got its name from the Spanish press who first reported on it. In reality, it's not known where it started. But by the end of 1918, it became the biggest threat to life on Earth. Over 500 million people, a third of the world's population at the time, were affected. And in the end, it claimed more lives than the war that preceded it. The crisis came within the first two to three hours of your sickness. You either survived or you were dead. Today, the serious threat of flu seems a distant memory. Vaccines and research have helped mitigate similar outbreaks since 1918. But still, about 650,000 people die each year from complications linked to seasonal strains of the virus. Health experts warn another deadly flu like 1918 could make a return. There have been three pandemics since, but none nearly as catastrophic. This was different than the yearly pandemics or even the mini pandemics that had occurred prior to 1918 and subsequently. Urbanization, mass migration and global travel have increased the risk of pandemics. Modeling commissioned by Bill Gates found if a similar strain as 1918 was to come back, it would still kill about 33 million people. The World Health Organization lists flu as one of the biggest threats to global health. It's not a case of if, but when another pandemic will strike. How will the world react a hundred years after the big one? Very pleased to say that joining us from Nottingham, we have Jonathan Ball, Professor of Virology at the University of Nottingham. With me at the round table here, Professor Sunetra Gupta, Professor of Theoretical Epidemiology at the University of Oxford. Stephen Riley is here, Professor of Infectious Disease Dynamics at Imperial College London. And Hannah Maudsley, PhD researcher at Queen Mary University and specialising in Spanish flu. Hannah, I'll get you to tell some stories in just a moment, if I may. But, Stephen, I saw you nodding your head when Bill Gates came up on there, and the 33 <laughs> million if there was another similar uh, a pandemic. He says we should prepare for one mm -hmm. as if we were going to war and that we are not doing so, not taking it seriously enough. Yeah, I... I think most people would agree that there is a risk of, of another severe strain of flu. We just don't know when it's going to come. Um, and I think lots of governments are making you know, as, as good preparations as they can. And the UK, for example, ranks a flu pandemic as one of the, you know, the most significant threats to the population. So they do, there are a lot of preparations going on. But I think um, Bill Gates has a real interest in the science. And I think he spends a lot of time learning about the science, and, and he thinks there's, there's more we could be doing to so figure out what So you think it is likely or just possible? No, it will happen. We just don't know when. We don't know when. That's You're a bit more optimistic in terms of um, our health prospects, Sunet, aren't you? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think the likelihood of this happening, again, is very low. Um, my um, own take on this is that prior to 1918, flu would come back and burn through, causing um, look, several deaths, uh, but then it would, uh, it would disappear. But since 1918, because of the global connectivity that has increased and also densities of populations in cities and other areas, what we now have is this stable pattern where flu is w constantly with us. 
um, I believe that has the advantage of protecting us against further pandemics because what we are doing by allowing flu, permitting flu to uh, uh, exist, sorry, but what we are doing by permitting flu to um, constantly be with us is uh, preventing the build-up of a population without any immunity to flu. And Can I think you have an immunity to flu even though every strain appears to be, well, most strains appear to be different to the one that you've had last winter? Well, this is an interesting point. I think people forget that immunity, um, you can have immunity to infection, immunity to disease, and immunity to severe disease. And I think that any strain of flu will give you immunity to severe disease and death. And that is precisely what was missing in 1918. We had a cohort of individuals under the age of 30 who had never previously been exposed to influenza and therefore were susceptible to death and severe disease. And that is precisely what we saw. Jonathan, let me ask you this question because Sinet has covered it to some extent. One of the mysteries was um, why Spanish flu 1918 um, killed a different demographic of the population than one would normally expect. Normally, I'm told you would expect it to be the very young or the very old. In this case, it was the uh, 20 to 45 age group or something like that. Is, is that explained by what Sunetra says, that they hadn't been exposed to it in any other shape because they'd been away fighting wars, perhaps? It's, uh, you know, I, I will agree with both Sinatra and Steve in as much as we, we will see uh, another flu pandemic. We saw one in 2009, it wasn't very severe mainly because it was a virus that was highly related to things that we've seen circulating before. And therefore, we did have pre-existing immunity, as Sinatra just pointed out. The reality is that the viruses at the moment are circulating in humans. Uh, you can group them into two main groups. and There is cross-reactivity, there's cross-protection against viruses from those main groups. But we do know that um, viruses exist in wild bird, bird populations, which are very, very different to one another. And what we're not sure about is whether or not any one of those very unusual strains of viruses could emerge as it probably did in 1918. Yeah. It, was, it was a very strange position. The virus certainly seemed to behave differently. Why it caused severe disease in young adults, we're not entirely clear on. It's probably a factor of the virus, but it may well also be the fact that we've just come out of a world war. Mm. Is, is it true, Hannah, that... Um a lot of governments, and of course everyone reacted differently, a lot of governments thought we're not going <coughs> to tell um, people in our country how serious this is for a variety of reasons. One is uh, the war hadn't quite ended at that point. They didn't want to in induce panic. And, and, and they also really didn't quite know how, how to deal with it. And as a result, people went around thinking, well, it's going to be all right. And then suddenly, bang, that was it. Absolutely. I mean, the, the censorship that the, some of the belligerent countries that were involved in the First World War um, enacted in their... Um, press actually contributed it to earning the moniker Spanish flu. Um, Spain was neutral during the First World War. It had some high profile victims. So uh, they reported it on it quite freely in the press, um, in contrast to some of the belligerent countries. So people um, were unaware of how just how serious this, this might be. Absolutely. And governments, they hadn't really seen anything on this scale before. Yeah. Um, there had been a, a, a flu pandemic um, in the sort of 1890-ish, which became known as Russian flu, only killed around, <laughs> only killed, around sort of a million people. Um, but this was on a, on a brand new scale. And we've got to consider this pandemic in the context that this, this was the final year of the First World War. You had mass movement of troops around the world, troop ships, train travel, troops going from ports into countries. So it was a perfect storm of opportunity for this virus to spread. So, let's say you, you, you've got an awful lot of people moving from one centre to another, 1918. Fast forward to 2018, you've got exactly the same set of circumstances. You have social media which could spread alarm or could spread fake news, as we know about it. Now, the situations are not dissimilar, are they? Um, no, no, they're not. I think, I think the accuracy of information and the speed would be much faster now. And I think we've learned from other outbreaks, mm. things like SARS and, you know, to some extent Ebola, that very accurate, fast information is also a kind of public health tool. So I think in terms of informing the public, I think that, that would be a lot better if it were to occur today. Um, OK, so, so where, where are we now in terms of public health information? What do we need <coughs> to do to 
prepare ourselves better, A, as a population, and secondly, as, as a government's emergency response team? What would you say? Well, I, I think that these networks of travel are actually also a conduit for transmission of immunity as well as right. infection. So I think what we have neglected at the, in our thinking about the potential pandemic <coughs> is how we could protect ourselves against um, severe disease and death through by uh, using um, this principle, by inducing immunity that would perhaps not protect from infection but from death. And in Spanish, I think the mortality rate was 20%, wasn't it, of, of those who, who picked it up? No. Um, it was Well, this somewhere... is why you're here. Absolutely. Okay. This I'm is why I asked the question. <laughs> so it, you can tell me I'm it wrong. It certainly varied around the well, world. Well, I've got so it written down here. There we are. The average mortality was somewhere between 2 and 5% um, yeah. of the global population. But that there were some um, particular examples where that was blown out of the water. So, for example, Western Samoa, now Samoa, yeah. um, nearly lost a quarter of its population and up to 90% were infected. So there was huge variation. Um, and certain countries really suffered as well. India probably lost about 20 million people. He's looking at me as no. though I'm, I'm sort of <laughs> the table idiot, which, no. which is a, a role I'm quite happy to play. So, Ken, the, the one thing about the, the death rate is it, people don't realise how phenomenally high 1% or 2% is. So of, This is not of the population. You, this of, was of those who got it. So A case fatality rate. The, so the That's what I'm yeah, saying, 20% of those who got no, it. No, no, so the infection fatality rate, our best guess, is probably around 2%. Right. But because it's so transmissible, a really large proportion of people catch it. Yeah. So the real danger is in the variation in the, in the infection fatality rate. So in 2009, it was one in 10,000 infections resulted right. in death. We think it was two in 100 in 1918. That's a massive difference between those strains of flu. What, what you've just highlighted there is the fact that different populations suffer from infectious diseases at different rates, and that has something to do with the genetics of the people who are infected, but it also has a lot to do with the pre-immunity. So we know something like measles, which we think of as a fairly harmless disease, when you um, introduce that into populations that have never seen measles before, you can get very high rates of fatality. So, uh, you know, I think we're forgetting that complex, th these are complex issues, the, the spread of infectious diseases, but then how they um, cause disease within the human populations, there's a lot of factors come into play. But I, I still don't think we should lose sight of the fact that we really don't understand sufficiently what the nature of the viruses are that are circulating in the bird populations at the moment. So our understanding of the amount of variability and what those viruses could do if they were introduced into a human population. Okay, I'm going to make another statement now that you're going to tell me is completely wrong. Uh, you, you mentioned birds. Normally it goes from birds to animals to humans. Is, is, if that's correct, in this case it went straight from birds, they think probably, to humans, and that's so what's unusual. It's, Am I we, right or wrong? It's kind of half right. Okay, it's not bad. <laughs> it starts in wild birds. Yeah. Everybody else is just spillover. The real action for flu is in wild birds. That's where all the evolution happens. And then it goes into both domestic poultry and other domestic animals, and then it gets to us. So wild birds are really where it's happening. Mm. Then we get to see it a little bit in the domestic animals, and then it comes over. But as, um, as was just mentioned, we do have a lot of information about different flu strains that are currently circulating in, in domestic animals, and maybe we don't make enough use of that information. And I don't know whether that's part of what you've been looking into as well, but if, if, if you want to simply talk about what happened <coughs> in 1918, 1919, there must have been some extraordinary stories, like somebody coming home from war thinking the battle was over and finding that, it, in a sense, it had only just started. Absolutely. I've been researching a collection of letters held at the Imperial War Museum archives and a particular one really struck me um, along those lines. It was a captain in the Royal Artillery and he came home on leave to Southampton, saw his um, pregnant wife and two existing children um, while on leave, then went back to France to demobilise his men. Um, unfortunately, he caught the flu and died out there. Um, he'd survived the war, but unfortunately died before he could return home proper, and his wife um, gave birth to twins uh, a week after his death. So, you Do know... know if they survived? Um, it was one of these um, children that had written the letter, so it, 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 it made a, a huge impact on many people's lives. And, and it, it had a big effect psychologically, mentally as well, didn't it? it? There was did. a place called Suicide Woods. Yes. So, 
a couple of the hallmarks of this symptom, uh, this virus, what made it really, really sort of horrifically spectacular. Um, one symptom of, of this sort of type was the mental disturbance that could follow. Mm. So lots of people suffered very severe violent delirium during the infection and then could suffer very deep depression afterwards. And there was a number of suicides um, and even murders that were directly attributed to people who had gone through the flu and survived, but then, you know, they, they weren't over it. OK, well, cut fast forward now and we'll start to talk about where we are in terms of research. Uh, Sunetra, I know you're working on what would be, you described it as the Holy Grail, which is a universal flu vaccine. Now help us here because I think pretty much everybody has been told that when it comes to getting flu, you, you might be protected against that year's batch because you go to the doctor, get a jab because they know which one it's going to be. But next year it changes. So every year you're going to get a different virus. How can you have a universal vaccine? Um, what I use to, to describe what we're doing is um, something I call the wardrobe analogy. So the conventional wisdom about what flu has in its wardrobe, meaning the bits and pieces that are recognised <coughs> by the immune system, um, is one where it appears to have a lot of different hats. So it goes away and changes its hat and there you go, you've got to change your vaccine because the vaccine is targeting the hats. Um, so people have... Many groups around the wor uh, world are working on a different way to vaccinate against flu, which would cover against all the strains, and that is by focusing uh, the immune responses onto something that is they don't have a whole diversity of in the wardrobe. So it's, it, you can imagine that maybe flu only has one uh, set of socks. So, so they all have one thing in common. The problem has been so far that we've been identifying things that are different. <coughs> now we can identify things that they have in common and target that. Would that be a simplification? Well, that's what Bear people are doing. But the yeah. problem with the socks is that they're hidden. They're covered by the shoes. So what people are trying to do is somehow find a clever way of getting the immune system to recognise the socks. What we've done, and this is very recent work, we just published this work about two weeks ago, is identify a part of the wardrobe that is actually exposed to the immune system but not very diverse. So we're saying that flu only has five shirts and we've actually identified those five shirts and what we're now proposing to do is make a universal vaccine that focuses on those five shirts. Well that, that sounds fantastic. Jo Jonathan, um, presumably you keep your ear to the ground on all these sorts of things and Sinetra says there are loads of people um, trying out different ways of, of doing this. Realistic or not? What do you think? Um, I, I think uh, we have to acknowledge that this is something that we see a lot in virology. There are a lot of variable viruses out there. Uh, things like HIV, influenza, hepatitis C. All of these viruses have highly conserved parts of their wardrobe that we try and target with vaccines. But actually training the immune system to recognize those and then to mount an appropriate response isn't always um, easy. It's certainly achievable, particularly around something, a part of the immune system called T cells. So I know there's an Oxford group trying to stimulate T cells, which seem to have a lot more um, broad reactivity, so they can kill a lot more different viruses. But even then, that immunity still wanes very quickly, so you have to keep vaccinating. So it's a huge challenge. We know there are conserved um, hats and socks but actually showing the, them to the immune system is, is a bit more of a challenge. So, yeah, well, jo, come, come back in. Yeah, that, that's this is not the study that you're working on is not the same one that No, uh, not Jonathan at all. In fact, it differs crucially in that what we've identified are parts of the wardrobe that are highly visible to the immune system and play a very important role in natural immunity. We've been able to show that. Very okay, exciting times. So, <laughs> mm, very much. Um, and I think that... The, the technology for flu vaccines, a lot of the technology is very old and there are going to be exciting breakthroughs in the next few years, but they, they won't be a perfect vaccine immediately. They'll be protective against severe disease or they'll be protective against one group of flu viruses. So even when we have these breakthroughs, they're going to generate really important public health questions. If we have a vaccine that protects you from getting severely ill but doesn't stop you infecting anyone else, how do we use that? If we have 100 million doses of that in a 8 billion person world and there's a really severe strain of flu, what do we do with 100 million doses of that vaccine? So there, there's another stream of work which is right. trying to yeah. think 
what will the first, second, and third generations of these broad vaccines look like? And then what do we do with it? So, yeah, the, the problem at the moment is that you can make people not quite so ill, but you can't stop other people from getting the disease yeah, I mean, I might, carriers. I might defer to my kind of more virological colleagues here, but I, I think most people think that when we get a broadly acting vaccine, it's likely to act against severe disease initially rather than against infection. And so, Natural, would you...? Um, not... I mean, I, I... Well, there are two things to say here. First of all, I think that that is something we should be focusing on mm -hmm. as part of our arsenal. I mean, after all, this is one of the oldest tricks of vaccination. Use cowpox to protect, protect against smallpox. Yep. So that's uh, someone, something that I think has been somewhat underexploited in our um, sort of uh, vision of preparedness. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just to plug our own vaccine or uh, what we... Well, you're not there yet. That <coughs> will, though, protect against infection right. and transmission. You mentioned just, cowpox just and smallpox. Can, can I just bring this one in, Jonathan? Yeah, um, sure. and I noted that um, somebody had written that the US government just recently lifted a ban on the practice of engineering viruses to make them more deadly. They believe that this could actually help us identify and prepare for the threat of a new deadly virus. But there's always that Pandora's box business, isn't there? So once you start playing around with these things, if you open the lid and they're out there, That's it's, it's, it's a deadly of, business. Yeah, gain-of-function um, experiments uh, are incredibly controversial, as are... Uh, or as is the resurrection of viruses that are, uh, are long gone. Uh, the, the reality is, I think most virologists would say that us predicting the next disease X is going to be incredibly difficult. None of us expected the SARS coronavirus to emerge or then the MERS coronavirus. Coronaviruses were fairly innocuous things that caused moderate colds in, in children. There's a whole host of viruses out there in lots of different animal reservoirs. Any one of those might make the, the leap and make the jump. We do know that influenza has done it in the past and is therefore likely to do it again, but it could be anything. Yeah. Kind of people were not expecting 1918, 1919, were they at all? It, it was a complete shock. And my next question to one of these other people here is going to be, is that what we're going to see next? They, they had no idea it was coming. Absolutely. It, it took the medical... Um, practitioners by surprise they didn't have the technology to see anything as small as a virus at that time they thought it was perhaps some sort of bacterium so they were absolutely fighting against you know this mystery disease um, and as a result they were forced to try um, so social interventions which we would end up using today as well as um, hopefully universal vaccine. What does that soon. mean? For example isolation, quarantine, um, wearing protective um, clothing um, trying to treat uh, the virus with whatever sort of uh, remedies and, and treatments that their communities and, and families passed down. For example, um, lots of people during the Spanish flu used whiskey. They were convinced of its restorative um, they should powers. die happy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but also they tried some more extreme things, things like um, uh, strychnine and derivatives of creosote. They were literally trying to try, uh, trying Good to gracious. use anything that they thought might help. Come some way? Yeah, well, yes and no. So the, the social distancing, uh, so accurate information, really good local information, how much fluids are right near where you are right now, and how can you protect your family? How do you reduce transmission? Mm. Those are the policies that helped us control SARS. We never had a vaccine for SARS. We didn't even have a diagnostic. The reason we controlled SARS is we identified it by its symptoms and we educated people, especially in hospitals, how to control it. It's the same for MERS in Saudi Arabia. So to some extent, making a much better job of those traditional public health interventions would likely be our best defense were there a severe pandemic. And is this another one of the reasons why you think, Sunetra, that uh, we're not likely to see a replication of the events of 100 years. I mean, it will certainly contribute to our ability to manage the epidemic or the pandemic. Um, but I think the real reason we won't see another pandemic is because we all have some level of immunity against severe disease and death. How long do you think it'll be before I can go to my family doctor and say, immunize me and I know that's it, bang, that's it, I'm never going to have flu? Ten years. <laughs> 10 years. OK, and you're putting your reputation as well as some of your money on the line here as well, aren't you? Well, certainly my reputation. <laughs> if I had any money, I'd put it on the line. OK, last word, Jonathan, if, if you would. I mean, that'd be a great day, wouldn't it? it? It would indeed, but I think until then, I agree with Steve that, that what we're missing uh, across the globe is 
good health surveillance uh, so that we can quickly detect these infections as they emerge and then deal with them. So we all need to cooperate and people need to be aware of, of what might be coming. And we need to invest in the developing countries in particular. If SARS coronavirus had got into Africa, we might be seeing a, a different outcome. As it was, it went from China to, to Canada, places that were well used to dealing with these sorts of things. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Jonathan, thank you. Uh, thank you at the table here. Good luck with your work. I know there are others there as well. It'd be interesting to see who actually crosses the finishing line first. Hannah, fascinating stuff. Um, and also thank you very much, Stephen. Keep up with your work. And thank you uh, for watching this edition of Roundtable 100 Years On from the Spanish flu. More than 50 million lives lost. There is some hope. Ten years, says Sunetra. We may be able to get a jab that stops us getting any type of flu at all. Until then, we'll probably have a miserable winter. From me, David Foster and the team, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.